We talk through, at least in concept, all the decisions that one has to make in order to learn a manifold or do this nonlinear dimensionality reduction. Now let's actually go through a concrete example of a popular algorithm that has been proven to work over many different data sets and also has some really interesting concrete mathematical connections to linear dimensionality reduction like PC and SVD that we're much more familiar with. So we're going to be going through something that's called spectral embedding. It's also alternatively known as the Plotian eigenmaps. It has a couple of related names. Why it's called the Plotian eigenmaps, we'll discover that in a couple of minutes. So we're going to start, um, as before, with um, our data set in a matrix representation. So my X is my data matrix. It is an M by M matrix where I have M samples and uh, M measurements. Okay. Now I'm drawing it as this... Uh, this rectangle right here, as if there were more samples and measurements, actually doesn't really matter. You could have way more measurements than you have samples. All of the math works exactly the same as long, uh, yeah, as long as you know what they are, right? So you can alternatively draw this as a uh, as a matrix of this kind, where it's m by m, and everything is exactly the same. I'm just drawing that generically to as an example. So in the last lecture, we talked about making decisions about what does it mean to be a neighbor and what does it mean to be close to something. So let's make that a little more concrete and make some decisions here. So we have a couple of data points. Um, and let's say I'm just going to consider this data point in the middle right here. OK, now this data point lives in some high dimensional space. Right now, it's kind of floating around in, in, in XY space on this, on this board here. But let's pretend that it is M dimensional. M could be a very large number. OK, nevertheless, it potentially has some data points next to it. I'm going to draw these stars right here. And it probably has some data points that are farther away from it as well. OK, so the decisions that we first have to make are who are my actual neighbors? OK, so if I'm this data point right here, who are my neighbors? Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to learn something about the structure of my manifold by considering who my neighbors are in a way that is biased. I'm only going to count more my neighbors rather than the, uh, the, the data points that are not my neighbors. There are two popular approaches for doing this. Um, there's no right answer. I'm just going to tell you the two most popular ways of doing it. The first approach is what's called k nearest neighbors. Uh, it is a parameter in the algorithm where you have to squeak, 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 and define what k is. So you can say like, oh, my like five closest neighbors are my closest neighbors. I'm going to compute distances to the neighbor and then pick the k5 nearest neighbors and then draw a little graph uh, connecting myself to them. And those are my neighbors. And so it could be like three or something. So I'm going to connect myself um, using these lines to my three closest neighbors. And I'm going to ignore everyone else. They are practically non-existent. They don't exist as far as I am concerned in terms of computing similarities. I'm really similar to these are my name neighbors. Everyone else doesn't count at all. Uh, the second approach is what's called the epsilon neighborhood approach. So here, instead of defining neighborliness um, as the k nearest neighbors, I'm actually going to define an epsilon ball, or I guess an epsilon hypersphere around my data point where this has radius of epsilon. Okay, I'm define a little, little sphere of radius epsilon, epsilon usually being some number that you pick that's kind of small but not too small. This is important because if it's too small, you have no neighbors. If it's too big, everyone's your neighbor. Both of these are bad. So you pick some suitable number <laughs> based on your data set of what epsilon is. And you say, everyone inside my epsilon ball, I am their neighbor. And everyone who's outside my ball, I'm not going to count them at all. So you can kind of see here what's starting to happen. I'm just going to artificially add another data point right here, is this center data point is not going to consider this data point as its neighbor using either of these metrics that I've just arbitrarily defined. OK, so it's not within the epsilon ball. If I picked three nearest neighbors, it's also not one of the three nearest neighbors. But it is in the nearest neighbor of somebody that I'm neighbors with. So I can start making this little graph here where I am connected to this data point, but only through one of my neighbors. OK, this one may or may not be connected to that one. OK, so maybe it's like it counts within the three nearest neighbors. So we are connected that way as well. OK, and then, of course, these two are going to be connected to each other because they're really close by and they're also within an epsilon ball of each other. So either way, these two will be neighbors. So what you can see here is we're going to take our data set and start drawing a graph based on definitions of neighborliness of who's actually connected to who. 
Okay, so this is the first set of decisions we have made, and I've told you the most popular ways of doing so. But there's a little more to it because here, all I'm doing is saying who is connected to whom, but not by how much and how much are they actually important. So the second decision that I have to make is given that, that I have neighbors, okay, how close are they? How close are my neighbors? Are they neighbors where I say hi to them or I see them, but I don't know their name? Or are they neighbors where, you know, my cats needed a cat sitter and they can go watch my cat or <laughs> pick up my kid from school if, if I'm not home? Are they, how close are they really? Um, okay, so <laughs> we're gonna, here's that. So this is one way in which the non-linearity is coming into the decision-making process, right? Because we're not, this is not linear anymore. We're counting neighbors, we're putting these epsilon balls are. The closeness of my neighbors is also defined in a pretty non-linear way. I'm gonna try to illustrate that right here. So let's say that I have uh, two points, xi, and xj. And here is how far they are in Euclidean space. So if I were to define a linear method, then that would be the distance that they are apart. Okay, so this would be my, uh, my, my, uh, my distance. Um, okay, so this is the, this is the, oh, this is not the distance, this is the similarity. So this is how similar they are. Okay, so if they're super close together, similarity is high. If they're farther apart, the similarity is going to be low because the distance is, because uh, they're duals of each other, because one minus the other. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to impose um, an even more drastic nonlinear version of the similarity by imposing what's called a Gaussian kernel on top of this. So I'm going to try to draw a Gaussian kernel. And it's going to look something like this, okay? And obviously, this is just one half of the Gaussian distribution. The other half is over here. But because distances are always non-negative, um, so I'm only looking at one half of the Gaussian here. So what you can see here is in this area where the neighbors are super duper close, the similarity counted is higher than what it would have been if it were linear. Whereas all the way out here for something that's farther away, the similarity is practically zero. So this nonlinear kernel, in this particular case is a Gaussian kernel, you don't have to use a Gaussian kernel, um, but they're, it's very commonly used um, as a kernel, and it has nice properties that make it easier to compute, and so people use the Gaussian kernel. Um, basically, you convolve your linear distance with the Gaussian kernel, and you get this notion of a nonlinear similarity, and it makes it so that um, the closer neighbors are further exaggerated in how much you're contributing to your similarity to them, and then everyone else that's farther away um, is, is, uh, is, is, is ignored more and more. So this uh, over here, this one is the, is the linear kernel, whereas the Gaussian kernel is, is this one right here. And so we can define um, the similarity using this nonlinear Gaussian kernel. So it's kind of a two-step process. First, I figure out who are my neighbors using some method over here I'm counting. And then of the ones who are my neighbors, I'm going to actually compute how close they actually are, given that they're already my neighbors. And so according to this Gaussian kernel, we can write something like the following, where I can say my S I J. So the similarity between X I and X J is going to be, first, we're going to compute the vector distance between xi and xj. Okay, so I'm going to compute that. I'm going to take its negative, I'm going to define it, and take its exponent. Okay, this is the Gaussian kernel. This basically gives you this shape right here. It's not normalized. And this extra parameter here, tau, um, is kind of like the standard deviation or the variance of my Gaussian kernel. So I can make my Gaussian kernel wider so that I can include more neighbors, uh, or I can make it super tight so that it's only the super close by neighbors um, that are rising above uh, this line here and it kind of falls down and you, know, you can make it like very, very skinny like this, right? Like a really tight Gaussian kernel like this by manipulating this parameter. So uh, as I counted, there are now approximately two parameters that we have to just make a decision on. Like you have to decide. This is not automatically done for you. You have to decide which of these algorithms you're going to use for counting who is your neighbor. Either pick a K or pick an epsilon. And then you have to pick the wideness of your Gaussian kernel for computing this similarity matrix. Okay. So now that we have the similarity matrix, we're going to keep going with spectral embedding.
Okay, so now remember from the PCA lecture, um, the definition of similarity there was covariance. So that was a very linear notion of covariance. It was easy to compute by using uh, by using um, by using the matrix product of x transpose to x. That gives me the covariance matrix, and I can take the eigen decomposition of that in order to get some um, some space in which I can project my data. So there are some parallels here, and I'm using the similar letters on purpose. This is a similarity matrix. It's totally different than the covariance similarity matrix. It's defined in this very nonlinear way in the procedure I've described, but it is nevertheless has the interpretation that it is a similarity matrix. And it's a similarity matrix on the graph that I'm starting to draw over there of me connected to all of my neighbors. What I'm going to do next in the spectral embedding algorithm is to define an additional matrix, which I'm going to call D, which kind of means degree, right? And D is a diagonal matrix. And it's basically the sum of my similarity matrix over all of its columns. Okay, that's it. So D is going to be a M by N matrix, just like S is. This is an M by N matrix, right? So pairwise similarity between everything and everything else. I'm going to make a D matrix. D is going to be a diagonal matrix. It's only going to have values along the diagonal. Everything else is zero. Okay, so it's kind of like an identity matrix, except instead of ones, it has a notion of how like the sum of the similarity of me with everything else. Because some some of your point might have lots of similar neighbors, and some of them might be in like you know less sparse, more sparse neighborhoods where they don't have as much similarity. So you're going to sum all that up, and you'll get something that's kind of like the identity matrix in that that's diagonal, but it has values that are not all ones, depending on how similar like what are what are the sum similarity of that of that of that point. Okay. So that, given S and then given D, now I can actually define the title <laughs> of the algorithm by defining then the Laplacian. The Laplacian matrix, this is the graph Laplacian, the graph Laplacian matrix. I'm going to tell you how it's defined first, and we'll talk about it for a little while. The graph Laplacian is defined as D minus S. There's actually a couple of different definitions, but this is the one that we're going to go with for now. All of these are m by n square matrices. So it's exactly the same size as your data set. If you have a lot of samples, it's going to be really big. If you have few samples, it's going to be exactly the same size as whatever the number of data sets, uh, data points you have are. Now, Laplace uh, <laughs> was very prolific and responsible for lots and lots of things. Um, and so this is called the graph Laplacian because it is a discrete graph analogy to the Laplacian that you may remember from calculus. So it's basically like the discrete graph version of, um, so if you're on a surface in continuous space and in calculus space, the Laplacian is something about how different you are from your neighbors, like how things are changing. This is basically the same thing on a graph. Okay, so let's talk about that for a little bit, like why that kind of at least intuitively makes sense um, without getting into the rigorous details of how to prove these points. So what we're doing here is we're taking something that's kind of like the identity matrix minus the similarity. Okay, so you're going to have similar, you have similar, large similarity values to your close neighbors, and we're going to take one minus that. Okay, so what's going to happen is that the larger S is, the smaller L is going to be which means that on the graph, just kind of intuitively in a hand wavy kind of way, that's going to be a small change. Okay? So the graph Laplacian of the things that you're closest to is going to be kind of small because you don't have to do much to get over there, whereas farther away, the graph Laplacian is going to be large. Okay? So this is a thing that is going to be small for your neighbors and larger for your far away non-neighbors. And next, we're going to, you guessed it, Take the eigen decomposition of L. <laughs> All right, here we go. We're going to take the eigen decomposition of my graph Laplacian, this uh, m by n matrix right here, and that's going to yield uh, predictably a w and a, uh, a set of w's, which are the eigenvectors, eigenvectors, and a set of lambdas, which are the eigenvalues. Okay. Oh, I wanted to note that uh, because S is symmetric and D is uh, essentially diagonal, um, at L is also going to be uh, symmetric, and it is also semi-definite, but we can prove that on, on a separate occasion. So in any case, if you take the eigen decomposition of an L matrix that has these special properties, we have a bunch of eigenvectors and a bunch of eigenvalues. What I'm going to do next is keep the top smallest eigenvalues. 
Okay? And that's going to allow me to do the dimensionality reduction. This is going to allow me to keep the, the top of the most important ones so that I can straighten out this graph that I'm on. So instead of being um, curved like it is, I can actually straighten it out and uh, iron it, almost like uh, you can take um, you know, a, a, a napkin that just came out of the washer and dryer and it's all crinkly and you can just iron it and make it flat by keeping the top smallest eigenvalues. And what that's going to allow me to do is then plot my data in terms of W1 and W2. And instead of being in a, in a kind of a curvy shape, it might come out straighter. Okay, and these W's are W1, like they're going to be the top, the, the columns of the eigenvectors corresponding to the smallest eigenvalues of the eigen decomposition of the graph Laclaucian. So I'm going to take the top two in this particular case, right, and that's going to be the projection that I am going to be making. All right, now why the smallest eigenvalues? So the kind of the quick version, just the intuitive version of why that, make, what might, that might make sense, is that if you imagine your graph Laplacian being a representation of this graph here, let's imagine that your graph is actually disconnected. Okay, it actually has genuinely multiple clusters where there's a bunch of data points over here, they're actually not connected to a bunch of data points over here. Really great if you want clustering because there are clusters actually exist in your graph, right? In that case, the graph Laplacian is going to have a null space, which means it has eigenvalues of zeros, okay? So if you had zeros, you want the zeros because you want to be able to separate your clusters. If you don't have clusters, then you basically want the thinnest possible path. You want the spine of the data set so that I can unroll my S-curve, my jelly roll, or whatever it is. And that's kind of the intuitive explanation for, in this case, we want the smallest eigenvalues. Instead of in PCA, we were keeping the largest eigenvalues that accounted for the most variance in the data. It was the largest eigenvalues that accounted for most of the data set in terms of accounting for variance. Okay? So, a couple more differences, so the similarities <laughs> between this and the more linear way of doing it is uh, that we're still defining similarities and distances, but we're defining it in this nonlinear way. But nevertheless, we're defining a similarity matrix um, using this nonlinear definition. And we're also computing something that is a square matrix that is symmetric and semi-definite so that we can take its eigen decomposition. And then that eigen decomposition and looking at the magnitude of those eigenvalues is what's allowing me to decide what is the best way of reducing the data set. So instead of having it represented as M measurements, I could potentially um, top R smallest eigenvalues. I can reduce it into R dimensional space instead of the original M dimensional space. How do I make that decision in a sensible way that is a procedure that I can compute? Now, differences between this algorithm and uh, the PCA in terms of practical applications are many. Um, one of them is that, as you've noted, we are actually computing this L matrix here, this M by N matrix. So if you have a really large data set, L is going to end up being a sparse, potentially sparse, but a very large matrix. And so this is pretty computationally intensive. This step right here um, could, be, could be pretty hairy just to be able to compute the eigen decomposition of my graph Laplacian matrix. The other biggest difference from a practical perspective is this whole entire procedure does not give you a projection in the same way that PCA does. PCA is a transformation, it's a projection. I can give you a new data set, a new data point that I collect tomorrow, and I can pass it through the same projections and get a projection of the new data point in the same PC space that I had before. The same is not true here because the entire procedure requires me computing pairwise similarities between every data point and every other data point. If you give me a new data point, I'm gonna have to do this again this entire computation here. I'm going to have to do this again, and then I'm going to do that again, I'm going to have to do that again. And then I can give you a new space into which all of the data points can be nicely arranged so that they can be you know, nice and next to each other. So that is not a process that I can easily project a new data point onto. If I have new data, I'm just going to have to run this whole thing again to get a new projection space. Okay, so that's spectral embedding and uh, also called Laplacian eigenmaps. Hope you understand why it's called Laplacian eigenmaps now. This is one of the many names for it. You can do clustering on top of this. Um, like I talked about already, sometimes you actually have um, either approximate or exact clusters in this, uh, in this embedding space that I can learn by spectral embedding. Um, and uh, that's really cool. So just like you can do clustering on top of many of linear dimensionality reduction techniques, you can also do the same thing in nonlinear space. Be a little careful, but this is something that you can totally do. 
Um, what's coming up next is that we're going to go through a couple of other nonlinear dimensionality reduction techniques that are really popular, building on the structure here. So this notion of neighborliness and similarities and taking eigen decompositions of similarities and distances. Um, these are concepts that are pretty common for you to be comfortable with, to understand and have intuition for how the manifold learning techniques are working.